Hi, I'm Apostle, Prophet, and Messianic Pastor Guy Gifford. If you aren't already following me, I encourage you to subscribe to me at YouTube at Guru Guide Guy Gifford and on Facebook at Messianic World. Today, I'm going to tell you the secret hidden stuff in the feast or fast of Yom Kippur while I teach you about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the sixth of God's ordained fasts or feasts, uh, which all point to what the Messiah will do and is doing in the restoration, the reconciliation of mankind to God. And this one is number six. The, the day technically is on the 10th day of the seventh lunar month. Uh, today it's called the, by the Babylonian name of Tishri, but it's technically the seventh day. And, uh, and also technically it would be a Tuesday because the month would start with the full, the new moon, um, which would, of course was Yom Teruah. It's a holy assembly. There's a make an offering by fire. There's no work at all that's allowed that's to be done on this one. Uh, thus, you should prepare your food from the previous prepare your food on the previous day. Each person is required to humble himself. This day is to be completely reflective, reflecting on one's personal sins, community sins, and on the Messiah's white throne judgment of sinners to come. The high priest offers the largest of sin offerings, a bull for himself and his family. But does it indicate that even the most holy human priest is most sinful, thus we are even in a worse position? Or does it indicate that the high priest would one day be guilty of wrongfully condemning the foretold Messiah, Jesus, to be executed? We're reminded of each priest's commissioning ceremony, its foretelling and its fulfillment back in Leviticus 8, 24 Then he represents uh, then he presented the second ram, the ram of, for ordination, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. Moses slaughtered it and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. He also had Aaron's sons come near and Moses put some of the blood on the lobe of their right ear and on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. Moses then sprinkled the rest of the blood around the altar and its fulfillment. John 18.10 Simon Peter, then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Notice that Malchus was sent by the high priest thus representing the high priest and all of the priests in their guilt. He was the foremost man in the front of the pack leading the assignment. It's my personal belief that the word servant used here, which also means voluntary subordinate for Malchus, that meant that he was the official representative of the high priest and also a priest, since the high priest was commanded in the Old Testament by God to never leave the tabernacle or temple. And that's found in Leviticus 21.12. But rather to live there, so the high priest and the high priest after him 
used a man to represent himself outside of the temple. The high priest's room, uh, skip that. But anyway, you see that uh, the high priest uh, Eli lived in the tabernacle in 1 Samuel 3.3, 3, as well as Samuel lived in the temple or the tabernacle there. On this day, um, it's not actually required to fast on this day by God. The high priest was supposed to burn lots of incense in the Holy of Holies and make a thick cloud in the tabernacle. Especially the incense was to get into the Holy of Holies. The high priest was to sacrifice a bull for a sin offering for his own guilt and his and his family that he represents, and a ram for a burnt offering. Then the high priest is to take two young, unblemished male goats from the people of Israel and draw lots for which will represent what? The first one is to represent the Lord and is to be sacrificed, and the high priest is to apply the innocent goat's blood to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, foretelling the innocent Messiah Jesus' execution. The second goat, the high priest puts both his hands on the head of the second goat in a gesture that looks like a ceremonial blessing, which represents the high priest putting all the sin of Israel on the second goat. And then this second goat, with all the sin of Israel, is taken by a representative to the wilderness and set free. This second goat foretells how the murderer Barabbas would be chosen and be blessed with freedom by Israel for the sins of Israel. Think about that. We find the Barabbas situation in all the Gospels was annually foretold at Yom Kippur. Let's look at two of, the re two of them real quickly. Here's Luke 23, 13 uh, through 25. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out altogether, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was the one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, cry, uh, saying, Crucify, crucify him. And he said to them a third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent, with loud voices asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail, and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Also in Matthew 27, 22 to 26, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. 
And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. And it was so. God condemned Israel, kicked them out of the land for 1,850 years. Uh, okay. Then continuing on in verse 26, Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. The Day of Atonement's main symbolism is pre-memorialized reminders of Messiah's sacrifice and Messiah's white throne judgment of each person. First, Jesus reveals to us in Matthew 25, 31 to 34 and 41 and 46, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the sheep separates uh, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world then he will also say to those on his left Depart from me, accursed ones, into the evil fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We then have it revealed again by Jesus in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great, great white throne and him who sat upon it from those from who <laughs> sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. But I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hmm. So you see, everyone, all of us, our deeds have condemned us. So we must have our name written in the book of life. Think of this as if you are on trial for the worst ever crime with the worst ever punishment, literally an eternal death sentence. So think how you would think and behave in such a situation before God, your judge. You are totally guilty because of your deeds. Nothing would matter to you except the outcome of this trial. Even bodily functions such as eating, showering, drinking, and toilet would scarce come to mind. This annual day is a reminder to get ready now for that unique day and like the other six God-ordained feasts, they point to the Messiah fulfilling them. The point is that everyone has sinned and is guilty and is deserving of death because of your deeds. But if your name is written in the book of life because you have repented of your sins and given your heart to the Messiah Jesus, then the Messiah's atoning death in Isaiah 53 has paid the penalty for your sins, and you will have eternal life. An additional thing about Yom Kippur, every seventh year and every 49th year on this same day, the seventh month, the tenth day, the ram's horn is to be blown as the formal time when debts are canceled, the slaves were freed, and sold land reverted to its ownership 
uh, its family of ownership, and on the 49th year, no crops were to be planted for the second year in a row. This jubilee year is the only feast specifically requiring a horn from a ram, which is again symbolic of the Messiah's work and is technically a Sabbath. On Yom Kippur, it is traditional for the Jews to be at synagogue from morning to 3 p.m., then home until 5 p.m., then back to the synagogue. They spend the day in prayer, confessing all their sins, and then they do a catch-all confession for the sins they haven't confessed and the sins they don't remember. And they even try to confess for their sins that they're going to do the next year and have them forgiven, as if that were possible. The foods for Yom Kippur are any fully prepared foods which can be just picked up and eaten. Uh, samples would be sandwich fixings and finger foods are all fine. Or even pre-made casseroles, salads, leftovers and such. Ideally, sackcloth and ashes is how we should dress. Uh, and bread and tap water would best fit the humble, guilty prisoner aspect of this day. Symbols for Yom Kippur are the sacrifice goat and the scapegoat, incense, the Ark of the Covenant, especially the white throne, sheep and goats, sackcloth and ashes, books recording your sins, the book of life, and of course the cross. So this explains to you some of the secrets of Yom Kippur and what Yom Kippur is all about. I hope you will uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Guru Guide Guy Gifford, and to my Facebook page, um, Messianic World, and, um, and I'd love to see you there. Remember this, since Adam and Eve, God has always wanted a personal relationship with each one of us, like Adam and Eve did before the sin, when they could talk with him and he could talk with them. This is what God wants with you, this personal relationship. So if you don't have that personal relationship, I encourage you to talk to God every day, to read your Bible every day, and meditate it meditate on it every day for God wants you praying without ceasing and meditating on his word. God bless you as you get to know him because he will bless you. I guarantee it. If you like my video, be sure to select like as well as subscribe and select notify to not miss future great videos.